what are some things that surprise people most when you get out and talk to them about history in South Carolina? That South Carolinians in the back country were fairly well read. Being Presbyterian, they stressed the ability to read and write. So illiteracy rates among the white Presbyterian settlers, the back country, especially the men, was fairly high. Now, women were fairly illiterate because it was not seen uh, useful or purposeful for a lady to have the ability to read and write. So even in the wealthier families, sometimes your women did not read and write as much as men, but they did believe that men should have the ability to conduct business, to read, to write, and also to read the Bible and interpret the Bible for themselves. So I think that's another Presbyterian belief that really has made a difference is that teaching the children to read and write, there, there were, on the larger plantations, there were academies uh, where a tutor was hired and even children from the adjoining plantations and farms could come. Uh, and if you didn't have that means, typically you taught your own children to read and write at some level. Um, so I think the fact that backcountry South Carolinians, upcountry South Carolinians, before the war between the states were fairly literate is a big surprise to a lot of folks. Uh, our literacy rate actually fell after the war between the states when people did not have the leisure to anymore to to do that. They had to just survive. Uh, so there was a period where a lot of people went to work for the cotton mills and when the crops were failing because of war that they didn't stress literacy as much. So you know that generation that came up in the late 1800s was actually less literate than the generation that had preceded them in the 1830s to 1850s. Another thing I think that surprises people is just how hardy our ancestors were and how they could survive. They were in a wilderness and you know you come to a wilderness with basically an ox or a horse, a cart, an axe and a few tools and out of that you build a farmstead. How many people could do that today? And I think the young people are especially surprised by, you know, you didn't just settle with everything you needed. You settled with very little and then over time you made what you had. You, were, you had to become self-sufficient. And, and if you didn't, you didn't survive. You, you moved on and went somewhere else. Or you became uh, a tenant or a, a hired hand of somebody else. But I guess the, the sheer determination um, and use of resources that they had, that we, we've really lost. We, our, our society has lost, I think, the ability to survive like they did. I think if you put us in the woods with an ax and a pot, um, we'd probably starve to death now. One thing that surprised me is how little property rights women had. We think of, of rights that females have now. Those are recently earned. You look back into earlier annals of history, and this is not just in South Carolina or the South, this was all over. Um, ladies pretty much were subject to the whims of their husbands, socially and legally. I don't believe a lady could own and transfer property on her own until the 1850s in South Carolina. Um, you know, if a lady was going to buy property, oftentimes if she was a single lady, she had to have a broker to go do that for her. Ladies could not write under their own names. They had to publish under another name because it was improper for a lady to publish under her own name. They could not get involved in politics. Of course they couldn't vote. And I often tell people who want to go back, they say, oh, it's such a romantic time. It's so, these old houses are so beautiful. It's such a wonderful thing to go back and live in the past. No, not really. You know, if you were white, male, and wealthy, it was a little bit easier. But you subtract any of those factors, and life was not fun. You know, if you were, if you were black, if you were uh, female, or if you were poor, um, it was a, a miserable lot in life in most cases. So, and even the white, wealthy males had to deal with children and wives dying all the time from disease. The life expectancy in the up country was a bit better than the low country, but in the low country, before the Revolutionary War, the life expectancy was barely 50 years of age. Um, and you were lucky if you made it to 50. The nutrition was, was terrible in the old days. You know, the, the reason people were, um, they weren't that much shorter than we are, that sort of a misconception. They were a bit shorter, but they were much, much more slender because they just didn't have the nutrition. If you look at clothing that was worn by a grown gentleman in the 1830s, a 12-year-old boy now would have a hard time getting into it because they were so slender. People had diseases like pellagra due to a lack of niacin in the food, lack of protein. Most women, uh, except for the extremely wealthy that had access to lots of protein and calcium, had lost their teeth by the time they were 25 years of age because of calcium loss in childbirth and, and nursing. 
you had a lot of rickets. You had a lot of uh, consumption, tuberculosis. So the diseases were rampant. There really was no medical care. You had home medical care, which was a lot of folk medicine and superstition and things like sticking a knife under the bed to cut the pain for, uh, for, for birth. Um, you know, hanging an onion, onion around your neck to keep the, the flu or the cold away. Um, so it was the medical care um, I've learned uh, was just, it was less than substandard. It didn't exist really. Um, and a lot of it was superstition based. You know, the Scotch Irish, the Welsh, the English, the Africans, the French, everybody had their superstitions, the Germans. And a lot of it dealt with the supernatural. Uh, there was a strong belief in spirits the spirit world and ghosts and especially among the Africans, uh, you know, the what they called hoodoo or voodoo, which was voodoo in, in the Louisiana that area. They believed that the spirits could be manipulated against you to do things in the living world. Well, the, the, the white culture wasn't so much on that, but they believed in witches. They believed in werewolves. They believed in all sorts of demonic possessions. They believed, you know, anytime someone became ill, unexplained, they would oftentimes think that it was some sort of a demonic possession or that it was a witch working a spell on you. Now, witchcraft was not as taboo in South Carolina as it was in Boston or some of those places. South Carolina is often where witches came, uh, or Virginia. Uh, there was much more tolerant. You didn't, they didn't really kill them here. Uh, but yeah, there were, there were people who believed that things were happening by witches. A lot of things were done, of course, by the signs. When you planted, when you operated, when you did anything, it was by the celestial signs. And I believe there is some merit in that. You know, you look at the almanac and there's still people who plant on certain signs and things tend to do better. So I think those were, there was some merit in that. But a lot of superstitions that um, cause people to do things that we think are strange, sprinkling sand or salt across a doorway to keep evil spirits out. Uh, the bottle trees that we see, and those are even up here. That was brought from Africa. It was believed that when you put brightly colored bottles on a tree, usually it was a branch in the yard, that when a spirit, an evil spirit, entered your dooryard, they would be attracted to that bottle and they would go inside of it and get trapped. The bottles always had to be uh, bottom up with the neck down. And so once that spirit was trapped, it couldn't get out. But you had to honor that spirit's ability to go back to its former realm. And so you would take it to the cemetery and you would break those bottles about once a year. So that's why you go to a lot of African-American cemeteries and you'll see bottle glass, broken bottles, because they're usually piles because they would break those bottles and go back home. Sweeping of yards was another thing. Well, it was practical too. That was brought from Africa and you swept the yard so you could see snakes and vermin around the house, but also because you would sweep these designs, almost like these Zen garden designs in the dirt, because if an evil spirit approached your door at night, you should see the footprints of, of that spirit coming to your door. So they would sweep that out every day to sweep the footprints of the evil spirits out of the, the door yard. People painted the bases of trees white in the old days. In the South, you'd have a swept yard and every tree in the yard, the pecan trees, would all be painted white. Well, that was brought from Africa, and that was done uh, over there to prevent the trees from getting termites in them. Uh, but then it was done here just by superstition uh, and, and for, for tradition. Um, you'll see to this day bags of water hanging in doorways, uh, sometimes in the low country. And uh, you'll say, well, why is that bag of water hanging? They'll try to tell you it's so flies won't come in. A bag of water will not keep flies out. That bag of water is because a spirit cannot cross water twice in the, the hoodoo belief. So if it crosses that water, it's trapped in your house. It can't go back to Bakulu, which is the, the water world. Um, there's a lot of African beliefs that have worked their way into, into superstitions. Um, you know, things like don't let somebody sweep under your feet or you'll never get married. Don't walk under a ladder. Don't don't step on a crack. Um, all these things, don't whistle in the house. Uh, one of the the um, superstitions that still has a lot of merit now, and, and people still do it, funeral homes even, is you don't ever carry a body out of a house head first because it can, the, the person can look back on the family and beckon them to follow them in death. Back in the old days, a lot of people died in epidemics. So you'd have one family member to die, then the rest of the family would die off. And so it was thought that that person's spirit was beckoning them to follow them. So right now, the, the coffins go out feet first. So you can't look back into the household and beckon someone to follow you in death. Um, so those things are still done. Um, you know, when somebody died, they covered mirrors and looking glasses because they thought the spirit of that person would be trapped in it. They opened windows to let the spirit free. Lots of different things that surrounded death because death was such a part of everyday life. And so those spirit, the, those those traditions and superstitions really got ingrained into the generation after generation. 
What are some of the other most common things people want you to come speak about? What do people want to hear about? A lot of interest in the war between the states, although I'm by no means an expert on that. Um, a lot of interest in the American Revolution and the early settlement period, early agriculture, building traditions, how, you know, actual structural composition of buildings, how you can determine the age of a building by the structural components, what's used, how the boards are sawn. Um, that's always real interesting to folks. Um, you know, I can look at a building and tell you pretty much on site how old it is within, you know, 50 years. But it's just something you sort of develop. The proportions, construction techniques, the fenestration of the windows, the, the materials they're built off. I do a talk on mourning customs and death and burial in the South. Um, that's a real popular one, talking about the, you know, when somebody dies, the stages of mourning, the superstitions. Um, so that, that's one that's real popular. Um, I really don't talk a whole lot on military battles because that's not my line of expertise. Um, I'll leave that to the, the battle historians, although I do enjoy studying the movements and the military actions. We wouldn't have been a free country without that. And we wouldn't have stayed a free country without that. Why do you think there's such a hunger for people to connect to the past and to learn all these things? You know, I think that young people oftentimes don't have that feeling because they're so caught up in today, which is good. But I think once somebody gets to be 40s, 50s, they start looking back more than forward. And I think when you start looking back, you want to know more whence you came, what made you who you are, why you are the way you are. Our families become more important as in the way of family traditions. And I think when people start really getting concerned about their families, they also get concerned about the larger you know, spectrum of history. You know, why, where did my family migrate from? When did they get here? Um, what were they like? Um, did they have accomplishments that were significant? Um, you know, were they horse thieves? You know, you're always going to find a few of those. Those are the fun ones. You know, the ones that, the ones that didn't actually live by the rules are always the most fun ancestors to find. It seems that trends perpetuate through families sometimes. And you can look back through some of these lineages and it's a, a long line of criminals, generation to generation. <laughs> and then some have long lines of preachers and farmers and planters and lawyers and doctors. It's just what's stressed in the family. But, but I think that a lot of people truly are interested in history. They just don't have the time to explore it. And as we get older, I think exploring our personal history and then as a product of that, the larger history becomes more important to us. Anderson, the Genealogical Society, has a tremendous resource for studying history. The Belton Museum has a genealogical room as well, uh, if you're interested in your personal family history. It used to be Pendleton District Commission, now it's Lake Hartwell Country. Hunter Store, they have a big collection of historical papers and documents. Anderson County Museum is a tremendous research engine. I mean, they've done a tremendous job in digitizing documents and photographs, and so really, really good genealogical resource. Of course, the State Archives and History, uh, State Genealogical Society. Uh, every, every area, every district has a genealogical society, so I'd encourage people to get interested, to get involved with that. If you're interested in your own family history and own genealogy, because there are people who have done years of work who would love to help you find your ancestors and find out about your history. For people who have moved in here more recently, there's not really a whole lot here for them to research. They would have to go back to their own home state or whatever. South Carolinians are lucky because most of us who are native to South Carolina have families that stretch back in this state to 300, 350 years. You can find at least some ancestor. Whether you're, you're black or white, you can find some ancestor that goes back that far. Now, African Americans have a more difficult time, uh, a tremendously difficult time oftentimes going back before about 1920 uh, because there really were no public records kept of anybody before that point. Um, but the white churches and because they were property owners they kept property records probate records wills documents a lot of your african americans don't have that so unless they go back to a plantation register or something it's difficult to find names we actually have a farm register here at woodburn that when dr john bailey adger moved here from charleston and set up woodburn farm he brought with him nine servants from charleston that his wife had inherited um, there's a long story there, interesting how he, he never wanted to own slaves. He went into the ministry, his wife inherited slaves. They didn't want to sell them, so they came back to Charleston from Armenia, uh, actually set up a school and a church for uh, enslaved and free blacks in Charleston. Came up here, 
he brought his wife's servants with them and quickly found out that you did need somebody to work on a farm. So he was a very benevolent slaveholder from everything we've been able to find. But we do have the original register with the names of Dr. Adger's slaves in it. Um, those types of things can be a great resource for African Americans who are searching their ancestry. Um, you know, there really were no birth certificates or death certificates before early 20th century for anybody. Uh, and if you come from a line of people who were illiterate, it's very difficult because you didn't keep family Bibles. And so there are a lot of white people who have a hard time whose families might have been illiterate or not well-to-do going back before the uh, turn of the 20th century as well. Tremendously good research room is the Faith Clayton Library at Southern Wesleyan University. And Sheriff there uh, has done a tremendous job with the genealogical records, the Bibles, the documents. And so that's a good resource for everybody who's wanting to look into their uh, genealogy and history in this area and just general history of the communities. Anderson County Museum, of course, is wonderful. Pickens County Museum, Belton Museum, and there's so many different museums. The, the Upcountry Museum in Greenville um, is, is a good resource. The South Carolina Agricultural Museum is right here in Pendleton. If you're interested in agriculture, it's a tremendous resource for both historical information and a lot of interactive things for young people. To me, that's the most important thing. Those of us who love history, the most important thing is to instill a love of history into folks when they're young, when they're children. Because if you don't have an interest or a love in history when you're a child, chances are you never will. And so for families who are interested in history, I say take the children out. Take them on these history experiences. Take them hiking to historic sites. One of the greatest national historic sites we've got in South Carolina that's close by is the Star Fort in 96. It's the best preserved Revolutionary War earthwork in the Southeast. And it's right here in our own backyard. Uh, they tell the entire story of uh, the siege and the Battle of Star Fort. It was a pivotal point in the American Revolution early on. Uh, it tells, talks about the migration of the Loyalists to Canada. I mean, just all sorts of things that you can learn right around us. Uh, and I would say go to the web and search or word of mouth or go to somewhere like Anderson County Museum. And they could tell you where to go, They'd give you resources of places to go and things to see.